It is good. It's good to get together and to praise the Lord this morning. Amen? Man, we are glad that, that you are here. And we are, uh, man, we are two weeks into 2020. Are you excited? You need more coffee. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't know. Um, and we're in the second week of this series that we're calling Go uh, 2020. Uh, because uh, as I shared with us last week, if you, if you missed last week's message, you'll want to go back and watch the video or catch the podcast because it's kind of foundational for where we're going in all of this. We just happen to believe that we have a God who uh, is on the go. He's on the move. Uh, he still moves today in powerful ways. And, and we pray and, and we know that he wants to move in our lives and, and he wants to use us to move. And he calls us. Last week we, we talked about the reality that God calls us to go, that God has always called his people to be a people on the go, and a people on the go to share our faith, this good news about Jesus Christ and who he is with other people. And we shared about how uh, if Jesus was to write us a letter, the way he wrote letters to the churches long ago, that he would look at us, and, and I think there's so much to be encouraged by about what's happening here, even at Newbury Park First Christian, but I think one of the things that he would write to us is he would say, hey, Hey, remember, remember the loss. Remember to share my message of truth and of faith with the people right around you, with those who need to know Jesus. And that's something that we've made a commitment to. And as we start this year, we're just excited about what God's going to do through all of that. And uh, we know, while many of us who are followers of Jesus, we know that we are called to something, uh, some ways to share our faith, we also know that we struggle with that. How many of you would agree that you struggle with sharing your faith at times with other people? Any, any believers in the room, just you struggle? Yeah, keep them up high, okay? We're all in this together. There we go, right? I mean, the fact is, is that we, we shared last week that 80%, and this is a staggering number, 80% of followers of Jesus Christ who attend church regularly say that they've never shared their faith with a non-believer, right? And we're like, wow, that seems like a lot. But then we stop back and we say, but, but do, we? do we? Are we involved in that? Is that something we're engaged with on a regular basis? And by just our hands, we say, hey, yeah, we struggle to do that. Sometimes because we're afraid, we think that people will reject us, they'll reject the message, we don't have the answers. We talked about a lot of that last week. But the reality is, is that what we come to understand is that we're in this partnership with God. See, for most believers, there's, a, there's this great deal of tension. Uh, maybe even for some, you would say guilt when it comes to faith sharing. Um, we, we know that we should, but we struggle with it, right? And so we, we have this kind of sense of maybe some guilt. And, and, and I want to help you out with that this morning, okay? Not, not make you feel more guilty. I just want to help you out with that, those feelings that you might have, and at least to help us understand it. Because how many of you do feel some sense of guilt that you know you should share a little bit more and, than you are now? How many of you would say, yeah, I feel a little, I feel some of that tension there, yeah? Well, here's the thing. Last week we talked about this, this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It was the birthday of the church, um, or, or right before uh, when Jesus was ascending into heaven. He looked at his disciples and he said, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes, right? The Holy Spirit hadn't yet entered for everybody. God selectively had done some stuff, but, but he says the Holy Spirit's going to come, and when he comes, you're going to receive power. Power to do what? Power to be my witnesses, and then he says in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, right? So their location, a little bit broader, and then out to the ends of the earth. He says, so when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to give you power to witness. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, then you have the power of God's Holy Spirit living in you. Would we all agree to that? Yes, okay? If that is true, if God's Holy Spirit is living in this, and if the reason that the Holy Spirit came in the first place, one of the main reasons what Jesus said was when the Holy Spirit comes, he's gonna give you power to be witnesses, then if we're not being witnesses, what must that feel like for the Holy Spirit who's inside of us? 
I, I, yeah, I, I was sitting here thinking about that this week, and I thought, it's like, you know, I mean, obviously you can't contain the Holy Spirit inside of, you know, this body. That's what Jesus did, you know, and he came and took on flesh. But the reality is, is the Holy Spirit is inside of us, and I was just picturing, like, this Holy Spirit's power is inside you and me, and he, is, he has come so that we would be empowered to witness, and if I'm not witnessing, it's like the Holy Spirit's, like, going, like, like, come on, like, you know. So what you're feeling, what you're feeling is not, don't, don't mistake this, it is not guilt, okay? It is conviction. It is the Holy Spirit saying, I'm in here, and I've got power for you, and I've got power for you to do something, and you might not be doing it. So if you feel that tension it's conviction, it's the Holy Spirit wanting to do something inside of you that you maybe aren't engaged with. See, guilt is when the devil comes and, and tells you you're a failure, you're not good enough, you'll never be able to do this, and tries to get you stuck in all those fear things that we talked about last week that cause you not to share your faith. That's guilt, okay? Conviction is when the Holy Spirit's going like, hey, Let's do this, right? You know, you, you know we should be about this, right? I'm in here empowering you. And our job is to work with him to be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the, uh, the ends of the earth, okay? I, I, I like to say it in Newberry Park, the Caneo Valley, you know, Ventura County, California, the United States, and good Lord, we need it, amen? So, if the Holy Spirit's in you, he wants to empower you to be his witnesses. Now, last week we spoke about the fact, we spoke about this idea of having a faith-sharing temperature. We all have one. Especially if you're a follower of Jesus, you have a faith-sharing temperature, right? I mean, one is you, you just, you, you, you kind of know you should, but you don't think about it much. Ten is like you're always ready, okay? Ten is probably like you got some verses, you got something to give somebody, you're ready to go at any moment's notice, and when the opportunity arises itself, you're gonna bring Jesus into every conversation, okay? So you got between one and ten. And last week when we kind of like surveyed everybody, we admitted as a church family that we said, yeah, we're, most of us are probably at a five or less. How many of you still think, you know, yeah, I'm probably at a five, maybe a five or less. You guys do need more coffee, okay? Okay. Yeah, it's audience participation, right? And so, so we're like, hey, we, we know that we're there. We, we know that that's it. We admitted that that's the case. Um, and, so, and, and then we said, hey, we want to get better. At it. And the goal over the course of this next few weeks, okay, is not to make you go from a 1 to a 10. That, that's highly unrealistic, right? The goal is that maybe some of us through the course of this sermon series will simply move from a 2 to a 4, or a five to a six, or a seven to a eight, right? That we would take one step in that direction of living a faith-sharing life because God has empowered us to do this. Jesus died so that we could do this. And he raised the life and he saved us so that we could be part of this. Last week we gave this definition to the faith-sharing process that I, I got from a book by a guy named Lon Allison. Um, and, and the faith definition is this. It says, to share our faith is to partner with God and others to lovingly bring people one step closer to Christ. Okay, to share our faith is to partner with God and with others to lovingly bring people one step closer to Christ. Now, I want you to say that with me. This is kind of our, the definition we're working with for during this series. So say this with me. To share our faith is to partner with God and others to lovingly bring people one step closer to Christ. And, and, and so that's what we want to be about. We, but we have to remember that God himself is the chief evangelist, that, that we are partnering with him, but he's doing most of the heavy lifting. He's just inviting us into the process. Um, he is actively at work revealing himself to people right now. While, while we're in church, God is out, he's at work, maybe in here, he's doing it through his word, through other believers, through times of praise, that God is actively involved in revealing himself to people. As I was driving here to church this morning, okay, and I was really early, there's lots of people out, 
Okay, lots of people out riding bikes, walking, hiking in the hills, doing all these things. And every week I, I always thought to myself, like, why aren't these people in church, right? And I know you're like, well, you're a pastor, right? I got to think that, right? And I'm like, why aren't these people going to church, right? And, and this morning, because I'd been preparing this, I, w- I was watching, and there's these people, and they were, they, you know, getting ready, they're going on their run and all this stuff. And, and I, thought, I thought to myself, you know, they're heading up to the mountains. I thought, the Bible says that creation declares the glories of God. The book of Romans says that creation, creation itself is giving people enough evidence that God exists that they are without excuse. We talked about that last week. That that, that God is revealing himself, whether it's through creation, whether it's through scripture, whether it's through history, whether it's even, last week we said, even through science, as we discover new things about ourselves and our universe, we discover truths about God, and God is at work making himself evident to us, and he's doing all the heavy lifting here. All we have to do is help people sometimes like connect a dot or two, or to just come in and and tell people, hey, do you see that? That, that's, that's the Lord, right? He's inviting us into this process. You know, we, we talked last week about the reality that God is the one who is responsible for the, for the results, not us, right? We don't save anyone. We don't do the converting. That's God's job. That's the Holy Spirit's role, right? And if you think that your job is to convert somebody, you'll be sorely mistaken. God is the one who is at work doing that, Right? Uh, And and so all we are responsible to to do is to go and to share the message and leave the results up to God. And we said, hey, that that lifts a lot of weight off of us. For those of you who feel guilty and everything else or who are struggling to share, remember this. All you're called to is is to share the message. You're the bearer of the message and let God do the work, right? And, And so we're, again, we're just partnering with them. We looked at John chapter 6, verse 44 that said, unless God draws people to himself that, 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 they, that they will not find faith in Christ. And so God is about the business. While we're in here right now, God's about the business of drawing people to him. Maybe he's drawing you towards him this morning. I don't know. But God is about that business. We discovered that, um, that not only do we partner with God in this process, but that we partner with others as well. Uh, we, we talked about this reality that oftentimes it takes more than one person and more than one hearing of the gospel before somebody would come to faith, right? And so it need, we need multiple people. And you don't know where you're at in the process. You might be the seed planter. You might be the person that just for the very first time makes somebody think about, hmm, like maybe there's something about this God thing, Right? Uh, maybe you do something or have a conversation with your neighbor or you do something for your neighbor and, and they, for the first time they think, hey, maybe this belief in Christ is, maybe there's something to that, right? You might be the person who waters, right? Um, and, and maybe you're the person who's going to kind of go a little more into depth with that. I don't know. But maybe, maybe you will be the person that, that's at the end of that line who actually gets to simply ask the person do you want to put your faith in Jesus? And they say yes. And if you're not ready for that, if, you, if you're not aware that that's happening, you may miss an incredible opportunity because the king of heaven, the creator of the universe, is inviting you and me into this process. And guess what? He wants to use us on his rescue mission of saving people's lives. That's what he's all about, and he wants to use us. And, and, and this is so huge we said that successful faith sharing is not only when we share the message and a person just accepts the Christ on the spot. Faithful, successful faith sharing is when we simply move a person one step closer. So over the next few weeks, we're going to focus on three things. Three things that will help us partner with God and with others to lovingly bring people one step closer. So what are these things? Now, you all have a card um, on your... Uh, Everybody's got a card. You might have sat on it, so you're going to have to find one. Make sure that everybody uh, gets one of these guys. It looks like this. And on one side, it says um, prayer, care, and share. These are the three things that we've kind of broken it down to. Pretty simple. Um, Prayer, care, and share. And today, we're going to focus on the prayer aspect of of what that looks like. And so... um, uh, so hold on to this card. Now, here's the other thing. If you flip the card over, there's another thing, and it's got the passage from 1 Timothy 2 that's going to kind of be our main text as we kind of dive into this in a minute. But then it's got three lines. It says, my three. And what we want you to be doing is um, I've been praying 
really for the last several weeks, I've been praying that God would place upon you, our church family, um, three names, at least three names, of people who you know who don't have a relationship with Jesus, okay? Now, these aren't people like Uncle Bob that lives on the other side of the country, okay? We love him, but we're not writing his name down, okay? Um, now, uh, hopefully some church over there is doing that, okay, for, for him. Okay, we're just, we're just looking at our Jerusalem, right, our, our area here. So these are three names of people that you come into contact with on, on a regular basis. It could be, you know, might be somebody in your home that needs to know Jesus. It might be somebody at work. It might be someone at school. It might be somebody on a, on a team. It might be somebody that, you know, at a place of business that you frequent. It might be somebody at the gym. It might, it, it, whoever it could be, just think about and allow God to put three names on your heart. Now, if you're visiting with us this morning, that's okay. You write the names down, and we're going to pray that God will help you as you go wherever you're going to, to help these people and to be part of this process, right? So even this morning, as we're kind of going through the rest of the message, if God brings just a name, if a name just pops into your head, jot that thing down, okay? Yeah, if you need you know, some extra time, take it home with you and write it down. We'll be using these for the next couple weeks, and bring these back each week, all right? And, and we want to be about you know, helping people, we're going to partner with God and with others to help people take one step closer to Christ, right? So this morning, we're, we're going to focus on the critical place that prayer plays in faith sharing. Prayer, like faith sharing, is something that most Christ followers agree is an important part of following Christ. How many of you in here, if you're a follower of Jesus, how many of you would agree that prayer is an absolutely vital part uh, uh, of growing in your faith. How many, of you, how many of you would say that that's true? Okay, good. Now here's the question. The question is, how much time do you actually dedicate to doing that? L like, a lot of us will say, absolutely, we believe that this is true. That prayer works, that prayer is important. But the question then is, how much time are you actually focused on praying? And especially when it comes to praying for people who are lost. I mean, I, I think we would all agree, okay, um, that we underutilize the power of prayer in our lives. How many of you would agree to that? We underutilize the power of prayer. Yeah, I think it's probably just about the same number of people who raised their hand earlier, right? We all know it's true. We also also understand that we underutilize its power, right? I mean, I mean, I know I do, and I'm a I'm a pastor, right? And and, and I know that I could be, I should be spending more of my time dedicated to prayer because if we believe that God, what God's word says is true and that prayer is powerful and it's effective, then I ought to be doing more of it, okay? Now again, we're not here today to make us just feel guilty about prayer. We're here today to say, hey, we can do this. We can do this. God has opened up the opportunity for us through his Holy Spirit to have this direct communication with the God of the universe. He has said he wants to hear from you. He said he wants to engage with you in prayer. He wants to have conversation with you. He wants to do that. He, and, and he's made a way for us to do this. And the question is, will we step into that? Will we actually do it? Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, um, he was a gifted evangelist and um, uh, just a, a great speaker, but uh, one of the things that he was known for is uh, when you talk about uh, evangelism or, or faith sharing temperature, you know, we might be at a five. B Bill Bright was at like, you know, on the scale of one to 10, he was like a 15, okay? Bill Bright was known to, when he would have to fly somewhere, he would, um, he would always book the middle seat on an airplane. And when somebody asked him, why are you always sitting in the middle seat? He says, because then God gives me two people to share my faith with. Right? He goes, I got a captive audience for a couple hours, okay? He says, now, he goes, now I want to be sensitive. If they don't want to talk about it, I'm not going to talk about it. But he goes, you know what? But the odds are a whole lot better if I'm sitting in the middle, right? And I'm thinking, how many of you would pick the middle seat on an airplane so that you could have the opportunity to share your faith with more people, right? I'm like, that guy's a 15. That guy's, you know, that's, you know, I'm getting ready this week to get on an airplane, like 13 and a half hour flight, to, you know, to, uh, that's just the first flight to Cambodia, 
And, and I'm sitting here like being under conviction going, oh, should I book the middle seat, right? So I got me and, and, and Barry Kirschman, who's going with me, I was, like, I was like, okay, so at least on the first flight, and I was looking at the things, I was trying to figure it out, so at least we, uh, there's one poor guy's in trouble, because I put us, I left a middle seat empty in, in between us. I thought at least one of us might be awake, you know, to, uh, to help share faith with this guy. So uh, you can pray for that guy, right? <laughs> um, then there's another leg where I did. I'm like, okay, we're gonna, I'm going to sit in the middle and see what, see what happens. Okay, that one's only about a three and a half hour flight or something. We'll, we'll see. But I believe God could do something, right? And I'm praying about it now because it's just like, hey, if I start praying about it, at least I'm thinking, I'm engaging in this. So Bill Bright, that's what he would do. But he had this great statement when it came to the power of prayer and its connection to faith sharing. Uh, and, and this is what Bill Bright said. He said, um, before I talk to people about God, I first talk to God about people, right? I mean, that's huge. He says, before I talk to people about God, I first talk to God about people. I want, I want you to say that with me. Before I talk to people about God, I first talk to God about people. See, I get this messed up sometimes, right? I mean, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm a pastor. I'm, a, I'm kind of like a professional Christian, right? It's like I went to Bible college. I went to seminary like twice. And it's like I should know all this stuff. I got all the info. You know, I know the Romans road backward and forward. You know, I got all the, you know, stuff to share faith with people. And I have to admit, I'll, I'll be really honest with you. I have to admit that there are times when, because I think I've got so much of that up here, that I jump into a situation and I just start sharing something, but I skipped the first part. I, I forgot to pray to God and ask God to do his part in the process. Now, I think sometimes God makes up for my stupidity, right? I think God fills in the gaps for me, but you know what? There's so many times I think that maybe I'm not as effective as I could be. Why? Because I'm kind of, I'm jumping in and I'm depending on my own strength, my own knowledge, my own thought process, and I have left God out of this when in fact he's the chief evangelist in the first place. And if anything, I ought to go to him first because he could very well do this on his own without me. I love that. I remember in preaching class, I had this great preaching professor. I maybe shared with this with you before, and I remember one time he told us, he said, yeah, he says, uh, if you ever start relying on yourself too much, if you ever think all this, you know, preaching and stuff that, you know, it's all about you or that you've got all the right stuff to say, he says, remember the story of Balaam? Remember Balaam? He says, the guy who had the donkey who spoke, he goes, when you start to think too much of yourself, he, you just remember that any donkey can do your job, Right? God could very well do all of this without us, but here's the awesome good news. He chooses not to. He chooses you. He has chosen in his infinite wisdom that goes way beyond mine that somehow he's going to invite you into this process by which he's sharing the message of faith with other people. And on one hand, that is weighty and that is scary because I'm like, Lord, whatever you do, don't depend on me, right? But he's going, no, I, I, I'm with you. I'm partnering with you. I'm empowering you with my Holy Spirit. I am giving you what you need to make this happen. And all he's asking us to do is partner with him. So prayer is the first thing that we should do when it comes to sharing our faith. Prayer is foundational. The Apostle Paul believed this wholeheartedly. Um, in fact, this key verse that we're going to look at this morning in 1 Timothy 2, uh, verses 1 through 4, this is what the Apostle Paul says. He says, I urge you. Everybody say urge. What does that look like? Right? I mean, if you are urging your kid to clean up their room. Right? What does that look like? Right? If you're urging somebody to do their work or whatever, what does that look like? Right? It's like, oh, come on, let's get, you know. Paul says, I urge you. And then he reiterates it a little deeper by saying it a little different way. He says, I urge you. And then he says, first of all, first of all, to pray for all people. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. And then he says, ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks to them 
pray this way for kings and all those in authority, which by the way, folks, uh, all of our authority people, they need it, okay? And we're called to do it. So whether you agree with them or not, you're called to do it. The Lord says so, okay, right? But he says, do that so that we, um, so that we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. And he goes on, and he says, this is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants everyone to be saved and to understand the truth. For there's one God and one mediator who can reconcile God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ. God wants all people to be saved, and because of that, he says, your job in this process is, first of all, What? The first thing you do is pray. Before you ever open your mouth to share something, he says, first of all, pray. Now, you could do this, okay? Doesn't have to be a long prayer. I, just, I, mean, I do this on a regular basis. I get in situations where I'm confronted with a situation, somebody who wants to know about faith, anything else, and I gotta tell you, it, it does not take long to utter a little prayer. Sometimes this is my prayer. Dear God, help! Okay, that's a prayer, like, Lord, I don't know what to do here. You're going to need to jump in. You're going to need to give me some thoughts. You're going to need to, you know, take care of the things that are coming out of my mouth. But, Lord, you got to be in this. Because if I don't, I could botch this up really easy. Right? So Paul places this incredible uh, priority on prayer. He urges them. He says, first of all, this is what we do first. And like Bill Bright says, before we talk to people about God, we should talk to God First, about people. So prayer is this foundation of faith sharing. Faith sharing does not begin, like we said, when you start talking. Rather, it begins when you hit your knees and you start praying. And that is important for us to understand. Now, in terms of our faith temperature, and remember, or our faith sharing temperature, remember last week I said my, my hope and my desire is that each one of us would just move up one step, right? One or two steps on that faith uh, temperature notch. I actually believe that the thing that will help the most in ramping up your faith sharing temperature is for you to begin to pray about it, right? If you're praying daily about God increasing your faith temperature, about you partnering with God and others to help people move closer to Christ, if you just pray for it, I believe it'll happen. You know why? Because I've been experiencing that for the last few weeks, I've been watching as I've been studying, I've been praying about these messages and things like that. I've been watching, and here's what I can't figure out yet, okay? Just be really honest with you. Here's what I can't figure out yet. I can't figure out if, because I'm praying about it, that I'm just, my eyes are more open to it, or if because I'm praying about it and thinking about it more, that God isn't up there going like, hey, look, Ken's a little more engaged. Let's send this person his way. I don't know which it is. It might be a mixture of both. All I know is I am having more and more conversations with people just randomly in different things where I'm saying, where I'm, I'm, I'm kind of saying, bringing Jesus into the conversation. We're saying, hey, maybe this is what you're looking for. Hey, let's have a conversation about this. And I'm watching God do that. And, and I really believe that the thing that's going to increase our faith, temp faith sharing temperature is if we will begin to earnestly pray that we partner with God in this. So today, uh, I, I wanna give you really quickly, uh, I wanna give you several things that we can pray for while we're praying that will help us in our faith sharing process. Um, and then we're gonna end with uh, kind of a little uh, fun um, activity together. So what, what should we be praying for? We know that prayer is foundational. We know that we should do this. Um, what should we be praying for? Number one is this, pray for a heart for the lost. Just pray that God will just break your heart for lost people. Right? Um, in Luke chapter 15, verse 10, it tells us, it says, in the same way there is joy in the presence of God's angels, okay, in heaven, when a sinner repents. There's one thing we know that they throw a party for in heaven. And that's when somebody repents, when somebody comes to faith in Jesus, right? We know that the, we know that the angels of heaven are rejoicing, okay? So if we want to be engaged in that, just remember how passionate, how passionate is God Okay, How, what is God's heart for loss? Well, he sent his son. It says, for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son so that we could be saved. So God's pretty passionate about this. Pray to God and ask him, say, God, give me your passion for the lost. 
Uh, the second thing is this, pray for harvesters. We, this verse we brought up last week, Matthew 9, 38 says, so pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. Last week we said it's not a harvest, it's not a ripeness problem. Jesus said the fields are ripe to harvest. It's a worker problem. Is that we don't have enough people out there harvesting. Okay, So he says right here, pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Who is that? Anyone? Yeah, God. God's in charge of the harvest, right? So, so pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him. The Bible's telling us exactly what to do. Ask him to send more workers into the fields. Now, as you pray that, you guys over here, if you're praying that, you may be praying and God may be sending these guys over here. And vice versa, right? You just don't know. But pray that God sends more workers, that God gets more people engaged in this process of faith sharing. Um, and, and, and that's huge because we need more people. Wherever it is. I was, I was talking about, you know, maybe it's Uncle Bob that you're praying for. He lives on the other side of the country. Well, pray that God would send more workers to harvest in that area where your Uncle Bob lives. I, I know you, you're going, like, really? Is it that easy? Does God answer prayers or not? Do you believe that that would be helpful? If you believe it's true, then what are you going to do about it? Pray for more harvesters. The next thing is pray for open doors. Colossians 4, uh, 2 and 3 says, Devote yourselves to prayer. That's what we've been talking about. With an alert mind and a thankful heart. Right? I loved what Devin was sharing earlier about the fact that we need to rejoice in our own salvation. Be thankful for what God's done with you. And he says, And pray for us too that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. Ask God for opportunities. Like I said earlier, I don't know if God just like, boom, some people call them divine appointments. I don't know what God might orchestrate. But here's what I do believe. If you're praying for it, you will be a whole lot more um, apt to see the things that come up right in front of your face where you have opportunity to share your faith. If you're praying about it. If you're not praying about it, I, I'm guaranteeing you, you're going to miss a lot of opportunities. But if you're praying for it, you will be you will be ready for opportunities to come, and God will help you um, in that process. The next thing is pray for the right words. Ephesians 6.19 says, And pray for me too. Ask God to give me the right words so I can boldly explain God's mysterious plan. And I'm thinking, this is the Apostle Paul speaking. I mean, the Apostle Paul was never for a, a lack for words, right? He wrote a good chunk of the New Testament. This guy kind of knew what he was talking about, Right? And he's telling people, pray for me that I will have the right words. I, I, I got to tell you, I, I, I do that every single week. Every single week when I'm sitting right down here, right before I get up to preach. I, I say a prayer every week that says, Lord, I don't know what you're going to do. Um, you know what I wrote down. You know, you know what's on paper here. You know what I've been studying. You know, you know where my heart's at and stuff like that. But Lord, whatever you got to do, help it be the right thing. Right? Help, help the words be right. Um, what I know is, is God, God can do this. Uh, God does it in amazing ways. If you, if you go back to the, uh, the birthday of the church on the day of Pentecost, right? You have the, the Holy Spirit comes in power, just like Jesus said he would, so that they would be witnesses. And when the Holy Spirit comes in power, uh, he comes upon the apostles, they run out into the streets, okay? They didn't just sit there and go, whoa, this is really cool. We should all sit and sing Kumbaya, right? They just said, no, they ran into the streets and it says they started to speak. And here's what it said. It says that, that the people, there's people there from all over the world at that time, Jewish people from all over the world. And it says, and the people heard their message in their own languages. People were able to hear it, right? Now, I don't know what God did. I don't know what he did in the mouths of the apostles. I don't know what he did in the ears of all those people from all around the world. All I know is that they were able to understand what they needed to understand in the words that God needed them to hear so that they could get the message across. And the question is, do you believe that God can still do that today? Every week I pray, I say, Lord, whatever I say would you do that same amazing thing that you even did on the day of Pentecost where whatever comes out of my mouth, by the time it comes from my mouth to the ears of the people who are sitting here, you give them what they need. And you know what's wild? I, I gotta tell you what's wild is there are some weeks where I'll, I'll, I'll hear from people 
who say, man, when you said this, and I go, like, I don't remember saying that. I go back and look at my notes sometime, I'm like, I must have made that up on the way, or I don't know what happened. I don't remember saying that, right? Or what's even better is when two different people who heard the same message both heard something totally different, and I, and I just sit back and I go, okay, I think God answered that prayer. That whatever, I just say, Lord, whatever comes out of my mouth, you do something in that process. I believe that God can do that today, and here's what it does for us. It lifts a whole lot of weight off of my shoulders when I believe that God can do that and will do that because I don't have to go into every situation going like, man, if I say the wrong thing, that person's going to hell and it's all my fault, right? I can go, hey, Lord, I'm just going to be a vessel. I'm going to do my best, okay? And we should be prepared. We should do the best we can. We should study God's word. We should be in prayer. But when we do it, we leave the rest up to God and let God do the work that he's going to, don't you believe, God wants to do this more than we do. Don't you believe he's going to meet you there? The God of the universe is inviting you into the process of saving people. And the question is, will we or will we not get engaged? Now, the next thing that, he's, he, that, we, that we pray for is boldness. Uh, and it uh, goes on in Ephesians uh, 6, 19, where it says, so pray that I will keep on speaking boldly for him as I should, right? Several places in the New Testament where it talks about boldness. Now, how many of you know that you need a little more boldness when it comes to faith sharing? L- just a little bit, maybe even just a notch up, right? Okay. I love this. It, it, m- one of my favorite stories in the New Testament as the, as the church begins is in Acts chapter 4. Okay, Peter and John, they go out to the temple. There's a guy, he was uh, crippled, and they, they heal the guy, right? Peter looks at the guy and goes, hey, I don't have silver, I don't have gold, but, you know, here's what I'll give you. And he, he raises the guy up, okay, and now the guy who couldn't walk can walk, right? And guess what, guess what happened to Peter and John for their good deed, right? No good deed goes unpunished. They get thrown in jail, right? The religious leaders throw them in jail. You know, they're threatening to beat them and everything else, but there's not a whole lot they can do because... There's a healed guy there, and everybody knows that the guy got healed, so they're like, what are we going to do? So they grab Peter and John, they look at him, and they go, don't you do this anymore. Quit talking about Jesus. And, and John, Peter and John look at him and go, well, I don't, should, we, should we listen to you, or should we listen to God? Uh, God, right? So they let him go, and they go back to where all the believers are gathered, and, they're, they're, and they go back in, and I can just imagine this. Peter and John going, they're going, you're never going to believe what happened. We healed this guy, we got thrown in jail, the guys told us not to do it, we stood up, and yeah, Peter said this, and, and, then, and then here's what it says. It says that, that what they did as a group is they got together and it says, and then they prayed. It says the be- believers were together and they prayed, and here's what they prayed. They said, Lord, consider their threats, okay? Those religious leaders that threw them in jail. It says, consider their threats, And if it was me saying the rest of that prayer, it would have been, and beat them down so they don't mess with us anymore, right? But that's not what they did. What they prayed was they said, Lord, consider their threats and give your servants boldness to continue to preach. They said, in the face of whatever might happen to us, would you give us boldness to speak the word of God? I think God's just waiting for us to join in what he's already done through history and join him in this incredible process. The, the, the next couple things is this. The, pray that people will hear. In Romans 10, 13, and 14, you can go home and read that. And then pray that, that God would bind Satan. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, it says, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. Okay. They are unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about the glory of Christ, who is the exact likeness of God. So as much as we are at work trying to help people come to faith in Christ, the devil is definitely at work trying to blind the eyes and the minds of people. So we need to come against that and pray that God would bind Satan and his blinding of people so that we can get the message across. Because remember, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, it's against the powers and principalities, okay? It, it, it's against Satan and what he's trying to do. And so we need to be people who start to pray. Now, how do we start to pray and how do, how do we engage in this? How do we put these things together? 
Well, here's what I'm, I want to invite you to do. If you've got your card, take that card out. Maybe you've already started to write names on it. If not, think about that. Pray about this a little bit more. What I'd like for you to do is write down three names, the three names that God gives you on this card. And we're going to do something kind of fun because I'm a, I'm a tactile learner. I'm somebody that needs to see stuff um, firsthand, right? Um, so what we're going to do is in, in a couple minutes, we're, we're going to have our time of communion that we, that we usually do. And, and during that time, I want you, as you're taking communion, I want you to be in prayer. Think about whose names you're going to write down on here. And as God brings those names to you and you write them down, we're going to have some stuff. We're going to move out these tables right here. Okay, and then what we're going to do is we, we've got all these um, ball pit balls, and what I want you to do um, these are the ones these are ones from first service, okay, um, and what I want you to do is just write down, uh, come up, and, and if you got three names on here, write down three names on, on one of these balls, and then drop it in the drop it in the thing here, okay? Oh, we got one over here too, okay? Um, and, and what's cool is if if, if we do what would be normal, you know, for if, if all of us, okay, if all of us here today write down three names on here, then together as a church family, we're going to be praying for well over a thousand people, okay? Now, I can't help but believe if that we are actually engaged in praying for over a thousand people over the course of the next several weeks, that God isn't going to do something incredible. I just believe that he will. And what I want you to do is have this kind of long game in mind that between now and Easter, okay, you've got several weeks, right? I think you've got about uh, 11 weeks or something like that before Easter. Pray that God is going to do something where he gives you or maybe it's somebody else because you're partnering with others too, opportunity to share faith or maybe it's just invite somebody to Easter. What I'm all excited about is we're going to show up to Easter Sunday this year. And we're going to go, what's God going to do? Because we're actively praying for this right? How many new people are going to come because we're praying for them, we're inviting them, we're engaged in this with, with God. And remember, we're not just doing this by our own power, we're engaging with, we're partnering with the God of the universe on this. So this morning, oh, and here's the other thing, um, take out your cell phones. Yeah, don't, don't look at me, take out your phone, Okay. You guys all know how to do it. I know you're tempted. You do it all the time. I know, I know you're looking at the Bible app most of the time, right? Not playing dig it, right? Like, well, I do sometimes. So, like, um, but uh, set an alarm on your phone for 3 o'clock every day. 3 o'clock every day. Uh, you pick. I'm going p.m., Okay. <laughs> And don't have it be a memo that says, call Ken. Okay, so, um, <laughs> no, three o'clock, set, it, set alarm for three o'clock. Then what I'm inviting you to do is, when that go, alarm goes off every day, at three o'clock, pray for your three names. Now you're like, oh, I'm at work. I'm, I'm not saying you have to, like, stop working. I'm just saying, pause for a moment. Pray for the three names that are on there, Right? so that we're praying for our, our three names every day. Now here's the other thing that's gonna happen. I'm inviting you to do this too. Every um, Wednesday night at 6 p.m. and Friday nights at five, we have people who come to the church here and, and gather to pray. And what I'm inviting you to do is to come and join them. And I, I know I just like gave them a big job, but um, we, we have all these names now that need prayer. And so they're just gonna pray, all right? And um, they're just going to come in and they're going to pray, okay, we're praying for Norman. Do they know Norman? Maybe not. But they're praying for Norman, right? Because we're partnering with God and with other people. And I'm inviting you to show up on a Wednesday and a Friday to just come and to spend a little bit of time and just you know, pull these things out and start praying for names. Because I just really believe that if we're engaged in this and we're actually doing what God's word says and we're praying for people, and we're seeking God before we're even talking to people, that God's going to do something powerful. Do you believe that, church? Uh, yeah, it's a Wednesday night at um, 6, <laughs> sorry, and, um, yeah, and uh, Friday night at 5, okay? And we'd love to have you come. I know that the team would love to have you come and join them in prayer. So we're, we're going to move into our communion time because I've already gone a little too long. So um, this morning... Take communion. Ask God to, to work on whatever he needs to work on in your heart. 
And, and after you commune with him, uh, look at those names. Come up and write names on those balls and just throw them in there. And let's together see what God is going to do in an amazing way. Because he loves every single one of those names. He loves those people so much that he sent his son Jesus to die on a cross. And that's what we celebrate in communion that we have been saved through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And so spend some time thinking about that. Come write the names down, put them in there, and together let's pray and see what God does. Amen. Our Heavenly Father, thanks for the day. Father, you are an amazing God. Lord, um, I am in awe of the reality that somehow, Lord, your ways are way above mine because I don't know that I would want to partner with me. (laughs) But God, somehow you do. Lord, you are calling us into this process with you. And that, Lord, you love us so much that not only have you saved us through the blood of Jesus, but that, God, you call us to be part of the process of helping others come to faith in him. And so, Father, we we lift all these names up to you. We lift our hearts up to you. Would you give us a passion? Would you break our hearts for lost people? Give us an excitement and and an incredible desire to see people claim Jesus as Lord. And then God, use us. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for Jesus who shed his blood. And we celebrate that now as we commune with you, Lord. And ask the Father, your will would be done. We pray this in Jesus' precious name.